Pan 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 Psychast. Part two, the conscience. So originally, Pat, we were just going to discuss your paper, The Hornswoggle Problem, but we've all ended up reading your brilliant and fascinating book, Conscience, The Origins of Moral Intuition. Uh, We highly recommend it to listeners, uh, even give it a read before even carrying on listening here. So there's a link in the iTunes description, and we're giving away several copies on social media as well. So head over there to be in with the chance of winning. The thesis of this book is that although science can't tell what the morally right thing to do is, it can help us understand how we're motivated to care about others and explain how views on certain things might differ throughout culture. So we had Steve and Pinker and uh, Rutger Bregman on the show about three or four weeks ago. Mm. And Bregman's new book, Humankind, he makes the claim that fundamentally, biologically, humans are creatures geared towards cooperation and selflessness. Uh, so this might be a good place to start then. Do you think that humans evolved to be quote unquote good? Well, I, I am not sure that you should exactly say they've evolved to be good. It's clear that humans are intensely social. Mm. And and we think we kind of understand the, the biological evolution of that. We certainly are, are have tendencies to cooperate and to manage to get on to do things that are Uh, not achievable by a single person. On the other hand, it's also the case that uh, humans can be pretty nasty. Um, (laughs) That that is, even within the group, there can be individuals who from time to time uh, do things that are utterly selfish. Hmm. And it's also the case that humans appear, we don't know exactly what things were like 500,000 years ago, but it looks like humans, even hunter-gatherer humans, there tended to be intergroup conflict. That may just be a a regrettable but important part of of our nature. An important part of the development or the evolution of conscience, Pat, you say, is first of all that it's something specific to mammalian brains, right? Right. It's mammals and reptiles, there's something very different going on there. And an important part, you say, is something, without being able to put this any better, you say it's something to do with the self-care part of the brain, let's say, turning itself into or being re-co-opted for other care. Um, And you link this to do with, you know, kind of um, the need for a higher amount of calories, um, being warm-blooded. So could you... could you explain the story and how this develops for us? Yes, I uh, I think it is a really interesting story. I should mm. just say that although I tried to simplify things in the book by just talking about mammals, what I say really also applies to birds. Mm. And the reason why I don't always just say mammals and birds is because it's only recently that we have come to mm. understand bird neuroanatomy mm. well enough to realize that they have something that is analogous to a cortex, even though it doesn't really look Mm. like it. But to get back to your main question, what does sociality, as we see it in mammals and birds, have to do with, say, being warm-blooded? And the answer goes like this, that the advent of of warm-blooded creatures about 200 or so million Mm -hmm. years ago meant that the warm-blooded animals could forage at night mm. when all of the others had to wait for the sun to come up. And they could also live and forage in places that had colder climates. While the advantages of being warm-blooded are absolutely tremendous, mm. the disadvantages are also very significant. There's always a cost. And the cost is that gram for gram, a warm-blooded animal has to eat 10 times as much as a cold-blooded animal. And that is a huge ecological constraint. Mm. It means that it has to uh, be out and about, and it has to be successful much more often than its cold-blooded cousins. The main point I want to, to, to make here is that 
there are two ways in which you could get smart. You could mm-hmm. wait mm-hmm. for the, the mutations mm-hmm. to produce genes that give you the adaptation to the environment. And that's a very, very long, slow process. Mm-hmm. Or you could increase your capacity to learn. Now, if you increase your capacity to learn, the thing you need to do is make most of the learning postnatal because you want to be learning about the environment you're in, Mm -hmm. which is also kind of nice because it means that you are not only able to thrive in this environment, but your offspring may be able to thrive in a very different environment Mm -hmm. because their brains will tune themselves up to whatever environment they're put in. Mm. And thus we get the appearance of cortex, huge Mm. capacity for learning. Now, the downside of having cortex is that the infants have to be born very immature. Why? Because they have to have their brains tuned up to the environment they're in. So if the infants are born very immature, there better be somebody around to drive the predators away and to protect them. What evolution appears to have stumbled on is the idea that the circuitry for self-care, for seeing to my own food and warmth and safety, Mm -hmm. extends from me to me and mine. It extends Mm -hmm. to my babies. Mm -hmm. And so the care is underwritten by uh, pathways Mm -hmm. that involve bonding. So when my babies are born, I feel Mm -hmm. a tremendous urge and motivation to protect and feed and care for the babies. Mm -hmm. Now, the interesting thing is that that care can, depending on how a species of mammals evolves and what their ecological niche is, that circuitry can change. It can be for babies and mates, or it can be for babies and kin, or it can be for babies and friends. Babies are always critical, but there can be other individuals as well. The extraordinary thing is that we now know quite a lot about the the biological, the neuropharmological underpinnings of social bonding, whether Mm. it's to babies or mates or kin. Um, And you mentioned there, Pat, that this kind of comes from the idea of protecting each other from predators. Um, What is it then, neurologically speaking, that pushes us towards being selfless? Am I right in thinking it's something called oxytocin and cannabinoids play a central role? Yes. Now, oxytocin is a very, very ancient molecule and and plays a role even in, uh, or a homologue of oxytocin, even in C. elegans, the tiny nematode that has only 302 neurons. But in mammals and birds, and possibly even some reptiles like alligators, it seems to play a very special role. Mm -hmm. Now, it is secreted from very ancient structures, not cortex, but from the hypothalamus. And but it has receptors in many parts of cortex, as well as in parts of the reward system. It plays a very important role in motivating bonding and the endocannabinoids and and probably also the endogenous opioids make you feel good when the behavior takes place. So the reward Mm -hmm. system mediates this interaction of oxytocin to motivate and then you get this lovely rush of uh, endocannabinoids and and, uh, endogenous opioids that make you feel good. And this rewards you for doing the thing that you just did, for taking care of the baby or taking care of your mate or or what have you. Now, the story I've told you so far is really kind of simplified. And as always, of course, in biology, as soon as you look a little more closely, it gets very complex. But I, I think the basic story, simple as it is, really does help us understand something about our social nature. Um, just uh, on that point as well of, of on oxytocin, uh, am, I, am I right in saying that there's been at least some studies on, on how uh, the, the role of oxytocin can actually potentially lead to, I guess, antisocial behavior uh, in, uh, against outgroups because 
Uh, obviously, it might encourage you to bond with your in-group, but that might have negative consequences. As in, basically, we should be skeptical about being too um, too excited about calling it the moral molecule. Yes, I molecule. think that, that that we should. But but actually, the experiment that you're referring to is flawed, and I don't believe it. Um, I mean, it, it it might actually be true what they conclude, but the experiment uh, doesn't show it. And I'll tell you why. After the results on prairie voles came out about the importance of oxytocin in social bonding, for example, between mates, people thought, well, it would be really interesting to do experiments with oxytocin in humans. Now, in rodents, we just put the oxytocin directly into their brains Hmm. to change their behavior. But obviously, you don't do that with a human. So in Ernst Fair's lab, one of his graduate students, Cosfield, had the idea that you could put oxytocin in a nasal spray and spray it up the nose. And if you were lucky, it would go through the olfactory bulb and into the brain. And so a lot of people did experiments where they would, say, run 10 to 12 subjects. They'd spray them up the nose. They'd have a, a control group. They reported all kinds of results. And one of the results was that it increases bonding within the group, but also increases hostility to members of the out group. Mm. Now, so far, everything looks tickety-boo, but it's not. It turns out, and this was again reported by Ernst Fair's lab, that many of those early experiments involved way too few subjects. And the other problem is that we don't really know whether any oxytocin gets into the brain through the olfactory bulb. And that's because... There is this thing around the brain called the blood-brain barrier. And mm. some, uh, some things cross the blood-brain barrier quite readily, mm. and cocaine is one of them. So you can snort cocaine, and it will get into the brain. Mm-hmm. Oxytocin crosses the blood, blood-brain barrier only with great difficulty. And so uh, recently, the FAIR lab tried to replicate the very first results that they had done using intranasal oxytocin, Mm -hmm. and um, they really did not get a result. And and so distinguished and respectable as this lab is, uh, they reported that uh, the results did not meet expectations. So that's why I'm, I'm a bit dubious about this experiment regarding outgroups. It may be true that that happens. Uh, we don't know. But I don't think you need oxytocin in order to generate hostility to outgroups. There's many other, many other neurochemicals on the palate that would do quite well. <laughs> yeah. Uh, clearly lost a lot of money on uh, ordering all those nasal sprays. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. It seemed like such a good idea. You know, people would say, well... You know, what if you go into the 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 you the American Senate and you spray it all the room? <laughs> yeah. you know, wouldn't that be a good thing? And I'm thinking, yeah, maybe it would actually if that that was a, a means of getting oxytocin into the brain. But alas, sure. it seems like it's not. Okay. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, as you uh, discuss in the book, um, aspects of human learning, such as the ancient systems of reward and punishment, chores first, play later, our ability to exercise self-control, like rats, uh, we're happy to wait for more food rather than settle for less uh, and avoid the wait, and the crucial role of dopamine and serotonin. Uh, on dopamine and serotonin, you write the balance between the two uh, uh, modularity systems is exquisite and may have a lot to do with the kinds of balance we try to achieve in life. So uh, could you briefly explain the role of dopamine and serotonin and what they do uh, into influencing our decision making and how we uh, how we kind of uh, balance our life? There's a lot there. I'm there afraid. is a lot there. Uh, um, the reward system is a very ancient structure, much more ancient, of course, than, than cortex. And um, in its simplest version, uh, when the animal animal does something for which it gets a reward, there is a a dopamine release in the nucleus accumbens. And this dopamine release helps to ensure that 
when the animal encounters the similar situation, it will do the same thing. Mm. So in its simplest version, um, that is what, what dopamine does. And that's why it's, it's referred to as, as a reward system molecule. But having said that, you know, I have to sort of follow it up with with the little sermon about complexity because it turns out that there are many different dopamine receptors. And depending on which receptors dopamine attaches to, you'll get one effect as opposed to another effect and so forth. And, and in the case of humans, the complexity is really very subtle so that you will get an interaction in the reward system to uh, a counterfactual imagining of, suppose I, I would have done that, then that would have been better. And the reward system is sensitive even, even to this counterfactual uh, consideration. Serotonin, again, roughly speaking, plays an important role in negative reinforcement. So when you do something and and you're not rewarded for it and you're disappointed or you actually feel pain as a result of what you did, there is serotonin release. But things get so messy because sometimes in some instances, serotonin can actually bind to dopamine receptors and uh, so, so life gets complicated in animals with big brains like, like humans. But without a reward system that is tuned up using dopamine and serotonin and the endogenous opioids, you really would not be able to learn your way around uh, the mm. environment. Now, obviously, there are, are rich and fertile connections between the ancient structures that house the, the the reward system and and cortex. So we've mentioned a lot of things here, Pat, you know, dopamine, serotonin, oxytocin. Uh, do you think that these origins kind of demean the value of the conscience um, on our decision making? I don't, actually. I feel that it helps us understand the way we are. Sometimes there are individuals who sneer at, at those who are altruistic or who are prepared to make a sacrifice to benefit others and think, well, they're just kind of kind of on the dim side. But I think <laughs> I, I think this shows us and, and I think this is something that Aristotle and Hume deeply understood mm. Mm. is that we are social by nature. This is the way we are. Um, or as Confucius said, virtue, virtue is not solitary. And of course, there are great evolutionary advantages to group living. But as you know, there are, are a number of mammalian species where they, they do not live in groups for one reason or another. Um, but, but many, many, many birds are bond to a mate for life. And they tend to live in in groups. Uh, a follow up on that question. Um, this is this is something that gets raised a lot uh, in discussions about moral relativism. Is that let's say if if morality is grounded in in an evolutionary societal norm basis, um, is there any way that we could meaningfully speak of moral progress uh, in a way that doesn't essentially just come down to different times and different cultures uh, do things differently. And so we couldn't possibly say that what used to be done in, say, the 1950s is is actually worse than uh, than certain current states of affairs today. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I like to think that there is moral progress, but I'm not sure, actually. I mean, this is something Paul and I disagree about. I think he's a little more on, on Steve Pinker's side here than, mm. than I am, because I, I worry that when when ecological conditions change, then people do whatever they have to do in order to survive. I think that's true of all animals. And, you know, our ecology right now is so different from how it was in the 1950s, but certainly in the 1850s or the 1750s, that it is no surprise that we do lots of things differently because it's easier to do certain kinds of things now um, than, than it used to be. 
I'd like to think that there is moral progress, mm. and I greatly admire Steve Pinker's attempt to 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 show how much better us guys are than the old guys. <laughs> but, you know, I I. Uh, I, I guess there is a, a, a part of me that is just very reserved on this on this question. So, uh, just a, a quick follow up on that as well is that uh, is from from what you're saying, it sounds as almost as if so. Obviously, bad situations uh, will cause people to obviously have to to look to themselves and perhaps their family first, and and therefore a lot of the wider morality might have to kind of fall by the wayside. But but by that very logic. The, these people would do differently if given the opportunity to do so. So we could say that, potentially speaking, people in, in the 1800s would actually uh, uh, try to widen human rights if they had the capacity in which they they were able to facilitate that. Um, so in which case, they could say that she, they understand that the life could be better. Um, and it's not that they think that their like their current way of doing things is necessarily the best way. It's just the only way, if that makes sense. Yes, thank you for that, Andy. I I think that is uh, that something like that is is most likely to be true. Um, I mean, if if for example in in the early eighteen hundreds and seventeen hundreds we had machines that could pick cotton. Would Americans have have bought slaves for the cotton fields in the great numbers that they did? I kind of like to imagine not. But human life is very complex, and and I certainly would like to think that we're getting better, or at least we know what the better thing is to do, even though sometimes uh, we're not in a position to achieve it. Mm. So one question that struck me when I was reading the book, Pat, was you might go. Well, look, if science tells us where our conscience comes from and how it developed, then it tells us what its proper functioning is or something like that, what its, me- what its job is and when it's not working. Likewise, you know, some good neuroscience will tell us, you know, how our eyes, eyes see things, the information is processed, et cetera, et cetera. So when it's working and when it's not working, someone might go, well, look, this means science can tell us when, can in bold there, tell us when things are right or wrong. Because doing the right thing is to in, act in accordance with one's properly functioning conscience, right? And doing the wrong thing is to not act in line with one's properly functioning conscience or something like that. Oh, I think it's a little more optimistic than mm-hmm. than I'd, I'd like to give credence for. And I'm not... I've always had a little bit of trouble with this idea of proper function, too. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, in the visual system, for example, you know, I can I can get uh, false three D with these floating sausages, as we call them. If I put my fingers in front of my my nose and look beyond, is that a proper function? It, it's an illusion. Mm. Is that a proper function of of my? my visual system for three dimensions well yeah in a way it is except that it doesn't mean no earthly good to do such a Mm. thing to get false false 3d and get a a floating sausage out of my two Mm. fingertips functions are a little bit different across the population because Mm -hmm. biology is what it is and variability is always part of our our heritability so maybe as things change, and we think of them in terms of evolutionary advancement, but at least, you know, what, what there is is a change in function of some kind. I don't think I ever use the word proper function in the book, but I, I think that I feel awkward uh, uh, about, about it. But I know philosophers of biology use it a lot and, and find it very useful. So I may just be wrong mm-hmm. here. So you mentioned the heritability. Uh, and one of the really fascinating and kind of compelling things in the book is that where you talk about the heritability of certain personality traits um, and how they feed into our conscience across generations. Um, and one example you might think that lots of people would intuitively like kind of kick against is the heritability of our political attitudes. So you say the genes that kind of will are responsible or encode like certain political attitudes. I think you say they're about forty 
percent heritable maybe can you explain how this works and why it's important because i mean most of our listeners will probably kind of go oh i don't think what my parents think i think all the things independently i have all these new radical ideas (laughs) but apparently (laughs) no apparently not Yes. Um, And the the heritability, so there's kind of two parts to my answer here. Mm -hmm. There's the part that depends on the twin studies on heritability. And then the other part that has to do with uh, using functional MR and connecting certain results to characterological features. So the heritability studies are done on twins the, the initial twin studies were the Minnesota twin studies with twins uh, reared separately, both, both identical twins and fraternal twins. And those studies indicated early on that there were a lot of things that were much more heritable than we had believed. So in order to get a much, much wider database, people began to collect information about twins, both those who are reared at home and those who are reared separately. So there are these now huge databases in Sweden and in Mm -hmm. uh, parts of America. And you can use these databases to make a rough assessment of the heritability of certain traits. And it turns out that political ideology, Mm -hmm. and here I'm, I'm going to mean being really quite liberal uh, or being really quite conservative mm-hmm. that that those traits turn out to be quite heritable about 40 percent now that leaves 60 percent that's not mm-hmm. but but that is very significant i suppose it's surprising but uh on the other hand maybe we just have to sort of say yes i i don't always follow my parents but maybe I'm a little more like my grandparents than I thought. Mm-hmm. So that's that's the heritability behavioral studies part of the story. The other part of the story and, and the functional MR uh, data needs a little bit of background to fill in. There is a, a number of political scientists and John Hibbing is, is one of them at the University of Nebraska who had made observations indicating it looked anyway, uh, indicating that people who in behavioral experiments Mm -hmm. would look longer at a very negative image than other people. So people kind of split on this or they would take, uh, they would uh, foveate very quickly to a negative image more quickly than other people. So Hibbing had the idea that maybe there are differences in the brain between people who go for the negative stuff Mm. versus people who don't. Here's the aside. Uh, How can you tell whether people are on where they are on the political ideology spectrum? And the answer is there's something called the Wilson Patterson assay. People answer questions, so it has to come that way. And on the Wilson-Patterson assay, uh, some people will turn out to be very liberal, very conservative, or anywhere in between. Now, the behavioral data on foveating to negativity that Hibbing saw distinguishes people in the following way. If you're very conservative, you tend to linger on the negatives and you foveate more quickly to them than the liberals. So that Hibbing thought, well, geez, maybe there's a difference in the brains when we show Mm -hmm. people various kinds of images. So he Mm -hmm. convinced Reed Montague, uh, who is at Virginia Polytechnic Institute, he Mm -hmm. convinced uh, uh, Reed Montague to run a big experiment. And Montague's experiments are always sort of watertight and well done and beautifully analyzed. So he picked the right person. And so what they did was they got, uh, I think, 183 subjects, and they showed them uh, a huge number of images. Some were very positive, some were neutral, and some were negative. And then they gave them the Wilson-Patterson assay, and that would allow them to say on a behavioral basis where these people were ideologically. So you put somebody in a scanner, 
Mm -hmm. Suppose that one of the images is an image of a man with a whole lot of worms in his mouth. This is the image I show in the book. But the, there are lots of negative images. Now, the image of the man with worms in his mouth is not a political image in any sense at all. When you show that to, let's say, one person, if the person had a very high level of activity and a whole set of so cluster of regions, mm -hmm. then you can predict that he will be on the conservative end of the Wilson Patterson assay. And they are right about 83% of the time. Oh, wow. Yeah, not trivial. And if you show very low activity in these clustered regions with great predictability, we know that you're going to be on the liberal end. So that is a very surprising result. And of course, what you want to know immediately is, what are those regions? <laughs> and the answer is, nobody really recognizes them as belonging to anything in particular. There's a whole set of things. It's not like there's a conservative module and a liberal module, <laughs> nothing like that. But the fact that your current political ideology and your current brain response to an image of uh, a man with worms in his mouth, the fact that there is that correspondence is very surprising. Then uh, subjects are shown again all of the images that they saw when they were in the scanner. Mm -hmm. And they are asked to rate whether or not they found them pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. And here's the interesting thing. If you had, while you were in the scanner, a very intense reaction by your brain to the worms in the mouth picture, you might or you might not say that it bothered you. In other words, there was a total disconnect between introspection of how you responded to that image and how your brain responded to that image. Mm -hmm. And that's mildly surprising. So those are, that's the story, and that's kind of where we are at this point. I should just add that there was a recent paper published that tried to replicate the behavioral findings of Hibbing and um, others in, in his group regarding how quickly you foveate to a negative mm -hmm. image and so forth, um, that failed to replicate the, the, the Hibbing results. Mm -hmm. So that's a bit neither here nor there, but they didn't say anything about uh, the fMRI results. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there is a significant degree of heritability. We like to think, no, you know, we are, I am myself. I come to my ideas myself. I come to my opinions on my own, my thinking and reasoning, and it's got nothing to do with who my grandfather was. Well, it does. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so in the, you mentioned uh, Thomas Nagel and his essay, Ethics Without Biology, uh, and uh, you say that it's incredulous that uh, you would think that in mainstream analytic philosophy departments, people should think morality is independent of biology, grounded in, autonomous, in, in an autonomous realm of truths discoverable by reason. Now, clearly, uh, many uh, moral philosophers are going to ask, uh, why not, uh, in that they, could, they might say, uh, there might be analytic truths of logic uh, or of mathematics, and perhaps it is possible to ground morality in some form of universal principle. Uh, that that principle might be relative, um, but it might still be uh, a useful way of determining what somebody ought to do. Uh, in that they might say, uh, you know, to commit the naturalistic fallacy of saying, "Do what your conscience tells you to do," might not be an adequate way to decide what is moral. Yeah, that's a, yeah, that's a sort of separate issue, and it's the issue that I deal with by really only focusing on on two philosophers. One is Kant, and and the other are the utilitarians. And I think that it, maybe it's possible for somebody to develop a principle that applies to all people under all conditions and for all time, but uh, the progress so far isn't encouraging, shall we say. Uh, and, and, and part of the reason for that, too, is 
it's different. What, what's troublesome about Kant is different from what's troublesome about the utilitarians. It may be that morality is just a lot messier. And if somebody can come up with a principle of the kind that you describe, and we can really test it in all kinds of situations as we do with, with Kant or with the utilitarians, and it survives, then, then that's great. But I don't see much prospect uh, for for that, I suppose um, uh, the moral philosopher might might potentially uh, say, well, abstract principles as justice obviously need to need to be worked quite carefully, uh, and and a lot. And I th- you, you mentioned this in the book about you, it's useful for people to have to come together, discuss, and and get people's opinions, and then and then come to some sort of conclusion. Um, but surely, when people are doing that, they need to. There is some form of reason at play here where we have to appeal to some some sort of thing where we say this is the most reasonable thing given the uh, given the, the data that we have available. Oh yes, and but I think we do that case by case as it were. I don't think that we figure out a universal principle that applies to all people under all conditions and for all times. I mm. think we say look, uh, we've got this difficult situation in front of us concerning whatever it happens to be, uh, I, I don't know, capital punishment, let's say. Um, and we have to come to an agreement here. So let's try to work it out. And I think that part of what has to go into that is is careful thinking, but it's also a motivation to do well, to be to do the right thing by the group. And so sometimes people do compromise in order to try to make progress. And maybe the solution is not what one would regard as perfect, but it's better than what you had. Uh, and and that, that seems to me to be, to be perfectly fine. And so I think, for example, on, on an issue like abortion, where people can get have very strong ideologies one way or the Mm. other. I think there it is possible for them to say, look, I'll compromise on this and maybe you can compromise on that because we need this, we need that. uh, And it wouldn't be fair to women if there was no possibility of abortion under any circumstance. And people go back and forth. And I think by and large, they manage could I just uh, quickly follow up on? Sorry, well, just one one other thing there, because I just uh, I could imagine a listener um, kind of listening to that response and just saying, "It does that sounds somewhat utilitarian in that if you if you if you have people come together and 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 hash out what might be best uh, the best compromise given given the people's interests, is that not some sort of utilitarian principle at play there?" Not really. I mean, you're not trying to maximize uh, universal utility. Um, The compromise can be with someone else's ideology as opposed to what you think is actually in their interest. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I get you. It seems to me that very often groups are able to come together and manage to to make a decision that doesn't make everybody happy. But at least it is better than the difficulty they were facing before. But Mm. sometimes decisions get made that in the end you think, oh, wow, that was that was really a mistake. I mean, people are saying that now, for example, about the draft, the military draft in the U.S. was that in the heat of consternation over over the Vietnam War and the lies that were told and the, the deaths that were happening, uh, people wanted to get rid of the draft. But now they think, well, it is a force for tremendous equalization in the U.S. And, and it means that classes mingle in a way that now they don't. Mm-hmm. So, so sometimes there is a revisiting uh, of a decision that seemed terribly right at the time. Why should people be required to serve in the military, especially when they're required to fight in wars that they think are idiotic? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, life is hard. 
<laughs> so I think a lot of our listeners and a lot of the readers of your book will find your account quite convincing, Pat. And I was trying to think of you know, reasons why they might have a, a tension with it. And one which I think uh, which was going through my head through the majority of the book up until your you know, your attack on the rule purveyors like the, the religious, the Kantians and the utilitarians is that is there any danger of you committing like a genetic fallacy here? So I'll just unpack this briefly for listeners. So it could still be true that there are objective moral truths, even though we have this evolutionary explanation. So it's similar to that cliche criticism we hear against theism. Like someone might say, Mm -hmm. you only believe in God because your parents told you (laughs) she or he exists. Well, they're missing the point. Explaining why I believe something doesn't necessarily undermine whether or not the thing I believe is true. They're confusing epistemology for metaphysics, like your example in the Hornswoggle problem. It's an Mm -hmm. interesting psychological fact about me, but it tells me nothing about the truth. So similarly, how I came about my moral beliefs doesn't make them subjective. Likewise, the critic says, you yourself might be confusing these things. How might you respond to this uh, objection? Pat? Yeah, no, I think that's an interesting, an, an interesting observation. And it may be that our, our natural predilection to be social and to want to get along and to please our friends and so forth does have the explanation of the kind that I, I proposed, but that independently of all that, um, there are, are certain things that are just absolutely wrong, like slavery. Mm. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I, I think that's entirely reasonable. And I think it's kind of for those reasons that I try to be fairly careful about saying that, Neuroscience can tell us what is right and what is wrong. Mm -hmm. It helps us to understand our social motivation, I think. And maybe it humbles us a little bit to realize that that social motivation is a huge part of our conscience Mm -hmm. and a huge part of why we learn and pick up the moral norms of our group. And it might make us think, well, okay, so that's what I learned growing up, but maybe it's not right. And those kinds of discussions, I mean, I think philosophers can be very good at um, in in helping people see that they might just want to be not too dogmatic and doctrinaire about their own Mm -hmm. moral beliefs. And Mm -hmm. that, you know, there are these moral charlatans who who claim to be able to tell people what the right and wrong thing is to do. And and maybe it's a good idea just to say, look, you know, you kind of got to watch these guys. I think you've answered the answer to the question really well. That's a great response. I think it goes back to the, one of the first questions I asked you, which was, you know, the thesis of the book isn't to tell us what we should do, but how we come to form these views. So maybe I tried to hornswoggle you there myself. <laughs> with, with I mean, what is what I, I guess I don't understand at all, either psychologically or neurobiologically, it, are, are the processes of reasoning and cognition that go into making these very complicated decisions. I, I, you know, I just don't, I don't understand it. Um, And I don't think anybody does. We may get there some at some point, but I think it's, it's a long haul. Okay, some quick fire listener questions then. Thank you to everyone who submitted a listener question for Pat. If you've got a listener question for one of our future guests, including Kate Mann, Kate Kirkpatrick, Hindi Andrews, or anybody else's name that begins with a K, you can find further information on our website. We've (laughs) each picked one each. I think you've got the first one to hand, Dr. Miller. This one comes from Alan Estrada from Costa Rica. And Alan asks, what is the most important topic in neuroscientific research today? Hmm, interesting question. An interesting question. I think decision making is extremely important. I think motor control is very important. But that is a lovely question. But it reflects kind of where my interests are, too. So I don't know if I would (laughs) want to say that those are the most important things. (laughs) Uh, our next question is from Fred Lepore in the uh, United States, uh, where, uh, I mean, he, he prefaces this question with, feel free to roll your eyes and say, next question, please. So uh, I guess that tells us the quality of his question. Um, so he says, uh, how much of the world's moral... Uh, uh, 
How much of the world's moral human cause evil can be attributed to pathology of the ventral prefrontal lobe distrib- distributed network? Oh, about 12%. Sorry, I just made that up. Uh, I don't. I, just, I, don't, I, don't, I don't really understand the question. So yeah, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, no, yeah. I'm sorry, Fred. If I've, uh, yeah, I've I'm sorry too, point. Fred. I am. Uh, I apologize for not giving you a better answer, but I will think Should about roll that. Their eyes. Yes. <laughs> So this is from at Tafkak on Twitter from the USA. Uh, is empathy hardwired in our brains or is it taught? And what do we know about narcissists? Do they lack the neural wiring or is it a learned behavior? Ah, well, I, I think there is quite a lot about empathy that is hardwired. Um, and but there is also quite a lot that's learned. So it isn't really an either or question. Yes, narcissists, of course, are very much on our mind recently. Um, but uh, I, I guess I'm not really able to say anything about what we know neurobiologically. Uh, and, and even with regard to psychopaths, although we know that it, it is a highly heritable condition, uh, we don't really understand the the brain pathways that are implicated in that sort of behavior but really really good questions both yeah so our final question comes from steve on twitter who asks if we develop teletransportation breaking down our bodies and minds and building an exact replica on the other side same person same consciousness (laughs) oh i don't know uh Let's see. I guess that violates the crick rule of making predictions more than five to ten years out. <laughs> I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say. It's kind would of you fun. step into one, or would you be too? Would you be too worried? I guess I'd throw caution to the winds. <laughs> So a round of concluding remarks as we finish up here, I'll kick us off. Uh, I just want to say thank you for taking the time to speak with us today, Pat. It's been a pleasure reading some of your work in anticipation for today's interview. Uh, Conscience is a really brilliant book, and I encourage everybody who's listening to pick up a copy. It's a great sample of your work that does what you've been doing uh, for a while now, which is providing philosophy and philosophers with the information from neuroscience, the relevant data from evolutionary biology and so on, and so we're not hunting for these answers in the dark. And yeah. uh, it reminds me for when we were speaking to, I think, Chalmers about Dan Dennett saying that uh, we shouldn't restrict our diet solely to philosophy. And if someone doesn't want to restrict their diet solely <laughs> to philosophy and they want to take Dan's advice, then your work might be the perfect place to go. What will I go away and think about? Uh, I think I'll go away and reflect more on the hard problem and whether or not it's really as hard as some of these other problems in neuroscience uh, you know, or some of these other problems we've spoken about today and try and reflect on some of my moral beliefs and whether or not they're just, you know, whether I'm just massively bigoted because of my grandfather. Or <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't yeah, think that gets you off the hook. Oh, yes. Well, thank you for having me. It was a great pleasure. Um, yeah, it's, uh, uh, these are all really fun and exciting things to talk about. And, you know, in two years the landscape will have changed. So it's it's great. Thank you very much for uh, kind of joining us today, Pat. I've really thoroughly enjoyed our discussion um, today. Um, and your work is brilliant. And, and what I really like is just very matter-of-fact and pragmatic approach um, to the philosophy of mind. I think that's fascinating. And your book, Conscience, obviously, there's lots to think about. There are lots of brilliant, engaging, interesting questions that I'm sure our listeners are you know, are really, really keen to read about. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm with Jack. You know, what am I going to go and think about? You know, have I just inherited all of my uh, political views from my parents? <laughs> <laughs> that's <laughs> that's <a> really good <laughs> question. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> only 40 percent um yeah i just uh <laughs> uh yeah my i've echoed much of the same thing it's it's interesting i've i have not a great deal of interest in the philosophy of mind stuff um and so reading your paper kind of summed up a lot of kind of what i felt uh and it was just nice to see it so succinctly put um and i think just the the general criticisms of of these thought experiments and stuff um i i think is an important thing for anybody uh dipping their toes into philosophy you should really uh, think seriously about um and then uh personally because my my 
general background is in ethics i thoroughly enjoyed reading um the stuff on conscience uh and i'll be using actually a lot of a lot of uh what i read uh in teaching my uh, students in a level as well because uh, i do a topic on the conscience there so i just wanted to thank you for for, for providing an excellent text for to, to share with with other people wonderful i'm so pleased yeah that means a great deal i would want to say thank you as well pat because it's been a really fun and uh engaging conversation and it's really nice to speak to you about your work, having read it for so long, right? You know, through grad school and then et cetera, et cetera, you kind of read lots of stuff and philosophy in mind. So I always like coming back to that. And it's just been, it's been nice to speak to the person behind it. I really enjoyed the conscience as well. Why? Because like Jack and Andy and Ollie said, well, it's, it kind of gives you this nice bridge of going from here's the, here's the philosophy at the end, but here's this rich, empirical data at the start and it bridges that really nicely and it makes it really clear in your mind and as i said to uh katie mack a few weeks ago well it made me feel really clever because i thought oh, i understand this this makes it really, <laughs> it's really clear it makes <laughs> sense. I, I understand how uh, the conscience evolved so i think that's uh, hey great oh that's work. wonderful and what will i go away and think about well the thing i want to think about is uh, given that my granddad isn't massively bigoted, where, where did my, what, how did I become so? I think it would be to jack all the time. That's the 60% there, Greg. Yeah, oh, good. I should say that my granddad isn't massively bigoted, and I apologise if he's listening. I hope he's, not, he's probably snoozed off if he's not this part anyway. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you all. Thank you all for your wonderful yeah. questions. You were so well prepared, and uh, yeah, it, it was it was really a joy. Thank you. Well, don't say it's a joy just yet, Pat, because there's one last little thing oh, no. on our menu here, which is pop pop philosophy quiz. Pop pop pop, 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 Philosophy quiz. So we're going to have quotes from three different people, and everyone's got to guess who they think the quote is from. So we're playing Patrick Churchill. So we've got quotes from Patrick Starr, the fictional starfish from the American animated television series SpongeBob SquarePants. We've got quotes from Churchill, uh, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom from 1940 to 45 and 51 to 55, and Patricia Churchland. Professor Emeritus in Philosophy at the University of California. So it's Patrick Churchill or Patricia Churchland. <laughs> Here's your first quote. The English never draw a line without blurring. <laughs> Churchill. It's Churchill. I think Churchill, yeah. That's, that's quite wonderful. Just do what I do when I have problems. Scream. Uh, Patrick Nothing Star. Patrick, yeah, yeah, It's yeah. Patrick. Andy, you're very hot on this today. Two word. <laughs> Nachos. <laughs> Patrick Star. <laughs> Patrick Star. Were I a solitary creature, like a salamander, none of this Patricia would trouble me. Patricia Churchland. <laughs> Andrew, you're, you're Sorry, no I'll, I'll, I'll take a step back. <laughs> we must be aware of needless innovation, especially when guided by logic. Patricia Churchland. It's not Patricia Churchland. And again, if this was QI, uh, Greg, you'd, the buzzer would be on Winston there. Churchill? It's Winston Churchill. Well done, Ollie. Not a fan of logic. SpongeBob, I think Squidward's taken us too far. That last snowball had a clarinet in it. <laughs> it's got to be Star. It starts, Pat. And we'll give you a final one here. Science is the great antidote to the poison of enthusiasm and superstition. That's really? Star. Nobody knows. Well, I'm, I'm, not, I'm holding back now. I'm not saying anything. I believe I that was Patrick, Patrick Star. Star. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it does I seem very you. familiar to me. Yeah. <laughs> a very special thank you to Columb St. Gabriel's and Westhill Endowments for supporting us uh, through your good consciences, as well as the philosophical zombies that are our patrons. We want to say a very special thank you to David Ligeness, Lily Hooper, Mr. T, Jimmy Casperson, Marun van der Kolk, Adam Cole, and Jim Clare, to everybody involved in supporting the show. An absolutely massive thank you. Uh, you've given us a great gift and it's not lost on us, so thank you very much. As you know, producing the Pan Psychast requires a lot of time and resources and we're incredibly grateful to everybody who shows their support, particularly through the COVID-19 pandemic. If you're enjoying the podcast, then please consider hitting the link in the iTunes description. 
if you're not enjoying the podcast and you're just here for Pat, well, first of all, we don't really blame you. And second of all, links to all her books, papers, lectures and interviews can be found on our website. Alternatively, you can cut us out of the picture and hit the link in the iTunes description, which will take you straight to her website. A link to Patricia's new brilliant book, Conscience, is also linked in the description, which comes highly recommended by us all. Don't forget, we're also going to be giving away several copies of the book, so head over to our socials to be in with a chance of winning. Thank you. You've been listening to the wonderful, beautiful, soothing voices of Mr. Ollie Marley. Thank you for listening. Mr. Jack Symes. Thank you for listening. Dr. Gregory Miller. Thank you for listening. Professor Patricia Churchland. Thank you for listening. And me, Mr. Andrew Horton. Thank you all for listening. That was brilliant, Pat. Thank you. Oh, thank, thank you, you so thank much you. for oh, that joining. That really me. was great fun. It was very funny to be asked why don't people like you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs>